Okay, everybody, welcome again. Uh, so this is the official OSC development meeting, Tuesday, August 8, 1 p.m. CST USA time, our normal meeting time on Tuesdays. So if you're not in the document, please follow it. The link is right here in the, in the chat box, and you can click on it if you're watching this online to go through the, the working document. So let's, let's talk about a few things here. So first, intro, intro development progress where we're at and then work work allocation so if you look at our development graph we're doing well it's slowly but surely we're climbing looks like last um, you know actually two weeks ago we hit kind of a peak of 200 actually 200 hours that one week which is that's pretty nice that's if you talk about 40 hour work weeks that's uh five full-time equivalent if you compare it to just a regular work week so that's pretty good we can say we have peaked that a couple of weeks ago at a five full-time equivalent which means that some good work is getting done and we can definitely see some progress increase on things and i do want to mention the 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 power cube design sprint of last week People were the power cube stuff. Okay, hey, paste the actual picture in here. Um, paste the actual picture so this looks impressive, people. Uh, this is kind of a, you know, just for your reference, the team meeting is uh, both um, an organizing meeting as well as showcasing some of the results so that people who are following following the project can see, can be more informed. So the more colorful this document is, the better. Uh, the idea is, believe it or not, there's a bunch of people that are watching these videos. So... This is not like we're not talking to ourselves here. There's currently we get about a hundred views or so, but you know that number. What matters about that number is you know how many people are watching it that actually matter. People who actually end up joining the team or or actually making some contributions because that's what happens. Out of the blue, you get various people coming up to the team because they they see something that they like and they want to join the team. So so please uh, paste in the pictures uh, to continue about the development effort the time graph here we're doing that through a google doc and, and pasting that manually so actually lex uh has been working on another app where we it's embedded into the wiki but basically you put in your hours but it generates all the graphs including the graph per contributor automatically and then he's uh, working on updating that so if somebody does not log that particular week they get an automatic email saying hey where please log your hours because it's important we got to keep track of this this is really how you know you, we measure our performance and therefore how we can improve or if people are replicating this kind of effort they can learn from us saying oh this is how you can grow a team this is how we do it so we want to document all of that that's real data for improvement talking about effort uh, I must comment about last week's power cube design sprint where I I, I kind of got a first feeling of of, of the power of this open source. It, it was really nice with the power cube that we basically doled out the work on a different aspects of the power cube. Um, so I'm going to go to the, the power cube part library. Do we have a part library page? Uh, power cube part library. Nope. Um, so let's go to power cube version 17.08 where we should have a link to the parts library so yeah we're starting it right on the page itself so those are things we've generated and that's not all of them because I know there's more and people just haven't put them into this because maybe we're not aware but for every project that we do we want to start a part library like if we're working on PowerCube version 17.08 and start putting in our, our pictures of our individual parts that are made I know there's more that has been made um, as in uh, design sprint document we've got the fan we've got the hydraulic pump we've got the basic model of the engine and so forth but what i noticed last time is when we had how many people we had like eight or so but it was really nice that all in parallel all the pieces just showed up and that's really good so it kind of gave me the feeling okay this is good essentially in a day of work and that was four hours of people combined together so it may be like like say four hours times eight people like 32 hours of work happened in that four hour period so that's really nice and gives me a feeling for how you can um, if you've got more people who can use FreeCAD and we know the procedures of how to work this and how to organize this then you can do really rapid development so so really good job people uh, I say that was a, a good milestone to see how how things are actually 
coming up in CAD in real time with a larger team. So good job. I must comment on that. And I really look forward to when we have many more people. You know, you can definitely be, th be thinking about the possibility of a complete design being generated in a single day once we have enough background work and, and, and enough structure, enough organization in the process. So really nice. Uh, kind of like a, uh, I think like a, in my mind at least, it's a turning point where we're starting to see that we can just, okay, just go at it and produce some very tangible results in a short time. So that's good. Okay. Uh, next, let's go to some of the working projects here. So we've got uh, work on various things. One thing we're working on in the background here is um, the CNC torch table axis. So actually, Emmanuel just arrived yesterday, and we're working on that. So we're building the the large one-inch axis system for the torch table. What we're doing is using one-inch rods, and the actual lengths of those axes are going to be 6 feet and 12 feet. So it's a pretty large machine, and we're using the the larger stepper driver, the Toshiba TB6600, like, like Oliver has showed, to run four motors on each, each direction and four of the very small motors. Now, why are we going with that instead of using larger ones? Well, there's a clear reason, and that is that all the parts are the same as the 3D printer, so the drive sprockets and everything else are identical, so we don't have to invest in any extra infrastructure. It's also a proof of concept of how we can scale the very small stepper motors to a much larger machine. So using the ramps controller but with external drivers which means that we can run as many stepper motors as we like. So that's that's what we're working on here. It's a quick update on that. On the on the filament winder maker, I mean this is great stuff here. We're pretty much uh, look at this. I mean this is good stuff. Full CAD pretty much all done. And I think we're finishing up on the on a bill of materials. Uh, really good. And we're ready for a build of this. And we said we're going to prototype this in September, September 16 or 23rd. I got to talk to Emmanuel here to see when we want to put the actual date on the calendar, either the 16th or the 23rd uh, for September. Now let's we'll talk about that this a little more. Continue after next step. next steps would be to. Just go through the build materials, get all the parts, and start printing. Uh, right now, I have three printers working here. I want to get that up to the six. I think I have seven total of the D3Ds that we have pretty much complete. I just got set up three more. So I was going to do that today, actually, because uh, we want to start printing more things and probably start printing out the parts for the filament maker, as well as for the other, other design uh, D3D frame, which is the plastic PVC-based power... Uh, PVC based frame for the D3D 3D printer. So I got to set up more of those printers here. Now, tractor construction set, moving right along. We just had a meeting right now. Uh, went through some of the design design issues, but we don't really have people, uh, too many people on that team yet. We uh, got to get more people. Uh, power cube. Let's see. What else? One more thing I want to mention is so the the brick press workshop is coming up on on August the 25th. So we've got a couple of people registered already. It's coming along. We're building the machine and the power cube. And one of the things that that was troublesome, of course, was the cylinder, hydraulic cylinder, because we just can't get off the shelf the kind of cylinder that we want. So. Uh, I decided it's about time to open source that for real, meaning that we get our own hydraulic tubing and, and shafts and we make our own cylinders. So I'm actually uh, looking at some sourcing from China on that. Uh, but it's kind of exciting because the truth is you can get all the materials like pretty much readily. Just to give you an example, I got some quotes on the cylinder tubing. And you can get, uh, actually it ends up costing nine hundred dollars for three hundred kilograms of it what's that mean that means enough material I, I did the math it's about four enough for like 40 hydraulic cylinders which turns out to like you know 25 or 24 dollars for the tubing for the cylinder and the whole cylinders end up costing off the shelf about five hundred dollars so here we can see evidence that we can get that price down to perhaps like a hundred dollars 
uh, for a cylinder if we just get the parts for it and make ourselves because conspicuously people don't really let you make their own cylinders like in the United States at least you can't really get the parts that easily they want you to to buy their cylinders so it's one of those things that are inefficient in that you can't, can't get the parts you can't uh, can't can't get them easily I mean you can just get them but when you get them they end up costing much more than the actual cylinder so it's kind of that inefficiency there which we're trying to address so that's good uh, if we make our own hydraulic cylinders hydraulic cylinders are very important towards the industrial economy uh, for any kind of work like presses or tractors or anything critical okay um, so that's on the open sourcing the cylinder working on that what what might end up happening there is we um, we want to provide basic conceptual drawings of the cylinder to the people uh, who are supplying that so out of that we probably want to generate full CAD for the cylinder so we really have an open good open source design which you can't find that like you can look on the internet cylinders you can see various designs but nobody's really got that open source on that okay um, ooh I see power cube parts pumping in that's good good people um, WebGL so so one of the steps next steps that we want to get into and you can try to take a look at that but we have a workflow within Sweet Home 3D software to generate WebGL exports. Uh, you can take a look at that. I won't talk too much about this right now because I mean we've got some other priorities. But but if you want to if you do want to take a look at that, do examine that because eventually what we're going to have to do is for all our machines, one of the features out of FreeCAD we're going to have to do embeddable 3D rotatable images that we can put in websites or on the wiki so that it's it's just easier for explaining things. And you can also add the part explosions to that. You can get fancy with that to get really good infrastructure for communicating three-dimensional information to people very easily within a web browser. So that's that's an important thing we want to work out in our general workflow. We won't get too much into that, just a passing comment. Okay, um, so where do we go from here? So as far as immediate priorities, uh, so the you know taking a look at the critical path here a little bit, um, just going through all the things that are going on. Circuit mill, Shane is working on that. I don't know when we will have a ready machine for that we can actually workshop. So we basically prototype that during a workshop, either like uh, an experimental workshop or an actual build workshop. But what we do is uh, when the machine is not really ready to be produced, we do an experimental workshop. So that's probably what's going to happen there. Do an experimental workshop on the build of the CNC circuit mill. Uh, with milling of circuits so we can do our controllers various electronics with it CB power cube so the design uh, let's see we're at August 7 here so that that line should be moved to like August 7 or 8 which is today so yeah the design is is uh, we're all done with that we made all the upgrades thank you all for the design sprint I mean I'll, just a lot of the upgrades and everything else we tackled that as a team got that all done I just sent the DXF files out one thing I found out about the CB press though um, not not the press but the actual software LibreCAD seems to I just could not import uh, import individual DXF files into so I could create one overall nested file on a 5 by 10 foot cutting sheet like they do at the at the shop they they nest it they put all the parts together so you can fit it on a 5 by 10 foot sheet of steel. I just couldn't do that. LibreCAD is apparently um, kind of lagging there, but LibreCAD, the two-dimensional DXF manipulator, two-dimensional CAD software, uh, it just kept crashing on me when I import things, so I had to, I was struggling with that and couldn't really complete that, so I just sent it off to the fab shop without the complete nesting. Um, so that's a real pain but what we really need to do is figure out a reliable workflow from taking where we left off which was the DXF files and nesting them onto one sheet so maybe that can be done within uh, I was thinking what are the ways to do it one way may be in Inkscape because I know Inkscape has the the manufacturing plugin for that where you can nest do things like put in your DXF files in there. So I think there might be a ready workflow within within the Inkscape. So there's hope. 
There's Inkscape and GIMP. Inkscape is the one that has the plugin for doing computer aided manufacturing. So we want to try that, but we got to develop that workflow because it was kind of frustrating. I kind of blew a day just messing with with LibreCAD. Um, and unfortunately, it's just like LibreCAD is, I don't think the development on it is pretty strong right now. It's something to look into. Maybe if we could uh, talk to the LibreCAD people and see where they're at, but definitely would be good to throw a developer, throw some developers at LibreCAD because, I mean, two-dimensional DXF manipulation, like that's very important, like for our regular tool chains, for any kind of two-dimensional cutting, you want to work with DXFs. And if we don't have a good, good, two-dimensional CAD program that's not good uh, LibreCAD I used that a lot before with the brick press it seemed like LibreCAD worked better before but now it's it's uh, kind of seems like it's not working anymore I'm on you know Ubuntu 1604 and it wasn't working for me so a pain point there on the development tool chain we got to figure out the 2d workflow so as far as the free CAD to generate the two-dimensional two DXFs, I tested Roberto's uh, procedure, the video he did, excellent work, and I hope you, you all have tried that as well, but the procedure in there based on Abe and Rob, Rob Roberto's work, uh, that works perfectly. You can extract the DXFs very reliably, no problem, no crashes or anything, so that's good. Uh, follow that procedure from now on. That should be our official uh, technique for getting the DXFs out. It works. So that's good. Uh, we're at the phase of CB documentation right now until the 25th. So, so we'll talk about more documentation about that. But as far as the printing, 3D printer, we have the 3D printer workshop this weekend. So we've got about, let's see, I think 10 or 11 people signed up right now. So we're going to have about a dozen people, a little more than a dozen probably. There's probably more people going to be signing up still. Uh, I'm printing the parts. But what we do want to do here, this this actually would be a good good chance to do some instructionals and see if we can do a, a possibly a design sprint right before game day, before before Friday. Well, Saturday is the workshop, but I would actually like to propose a design sprint on Thursday, where we maybe like do it for like a couple of hours, uh, where we all get together on actually doing the language agnostic instructionals for the 3D printer. Yes. It'll be a next big step. So Roberto did a very nice detailed video on that. So I don't know if you've seen that, but do take a look at that. We do have a very nice procedure for how we do the language agnostic instructionals, meaning starting from extracted isometric views that are neat and all nice and cleaned up using uh, Inkscape, using FreeCAD, and then using Google Docs, we can make very nice instructional. So look at Roberto's log for what he's done before and study that. Now, I would like to propose on that. So I'm going to say Thursday. Um, let's see. And, and let's, let's talk about it because which is more convenient for people. But uh, either like tomorrow or Thursday, do maybe like... I would call maybe for like a three hour design sprint where we get as many people on as possible and and document some of the sticky points uh, or maybe some of the tougher aspects of the build so that people can have that printed out in front of them and l just looking at this IKEA style build diagram they can put the things together. What we plan on doing this time is have people work not like less individual but more as teams last time we did pretty much individual where everyone went through the whole build this time we want to do teams where we do like do all the axes at one time do all the frames at one time and so forth so i think that'll be more efficient but for that if we can have some better documentation that would be awesome now the language agnostic instructions are very important they would go on our website they'll be like a critical high quality resource for building this 3d printer so that's going to be a major improvement to our infrastructure just like last time what we did was we got a lot of the the animated explosion videos assembly videos for the the 3d printer which were awesome and i think this time we can cap it off with some language agnostic instructionals which are just another 
piece of the documentation puzzle which allows you to build things very very effectively and very very rapidly so that'll be really good uh, so for everybody here I'm gonna ask you right now what would be a good day like let's let's do like Fridays I can't do Friday but Thursday tomorrow or Thursday can anyone um, get lined up for that like tomorrow or Thursday to do and I would say just 1 p.m. again um, simply because that's that's a pretty good time for everybody uh, that's a good time and we're working on the CNC torch table here in the meantime too uh, so let's see um, okay people so I wanna basically see a show of hands who can do it uh, so obviously this Saturday we're doing the the build so no design sprint on Saturday so the 3d printer workshop is this Saturday but Wednesday or Thursday uh, who can join Wednesday who can join Thursday would, would Wednesday work which is just tomorrow so we can get a head start and maybe continue through the week can people make that uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. okay Josh works um, let's get the names down for the design sprint so and let's do a little preparation slide here um, so let's put one okay so this is the la language So let's do a three hour session basically enough so we really get this dented and started everyone can work on it including myself so three hour session Wednesday 1 p.m. Um, so let's get some names down so we got Josh Okay, who else who else is doing it? Abe. That's good. So Ahmed, can you do the? So we're going to be working on a 3D printer documentation. You can join us tomorrow, 1 p.m. Or is that? I mean, it's kind of late for you, but hopefully you could be there. Uh, Ahmed, you can make it. He says agreed. Uh, who else? Um, pretty up in the air. Roberto, possibly Abe. So not so many people. But let's try that for tomorrow. Um, yeah, yeah. And whoever cannot make it for tomorrow, the idea is please watch it and, and see what we can generate so that by Friday night we can print off a few good pages. So we can focus on however much documentation we can get throughout the rest of this week. Uh, but the idea, the workflow is first of all watch Roberto's video and it's a nice well-made long explanation of the, the the language agnostic instructional process which we'll test for the first time which is pretty advanced I mean that's pretty pretty amazing stuff so so if I go back in his his log uh, here's on June 20th is uh, is the, is the actual video 
uh, language agnostic and instructional. No, that's that's a test. Here it is. It's on June 23rd. Uh, a nice four minute 20 second video showing the whole process. So I'm going to link to that. Um, I'm going to link to his um, entry page. Wait. June 23rd. There it is. So that's excellent. An excellent instructional and hopefully becomes an industry standard for open source development. So we talk about developing a general open source product development method. And I think this is going to be a critical aspect of it. Really high quality, scalable production of instructional. So once again, we can do that as a team. Uh, divide out the different modules. So divide up the modules. And what I'll do is I'll prepare... Uh, key modules plus scripts so a very basic script like what like what are the critical elements when you build to watch out for that's what we'll come to the meeting with tomorrow and then your task will be to to translate that script into graphical images that we pick out from FreeCAD so basically step by step and look at Roberto's log for what he's done on a sample the sample he's made um, but basically it, it want you want to capture the critical elements the critical warnings like do this do not do that and make it as clear as possible without using words so that when we take this for example to Saudi Arabia in November we can use the actual same instructionals no translation needed and that's that's important uh, divide up the modules, convert the script into a graphical language. Graphical procedure. Arrows, highlights, so forth. Look at the, the instructional video on how to do it. So we're all on the same page on the best practice for that. And we can, of course, as a result of this design sprint, we can say, okay, what worked for us, what didn't, so we can improve the technique. Um, so we'll convert that to a graphical procedure and that's essentially it for some of the key instructions so however people how many people show up and how many different scripts we have will determine what we can have ready for for Saturday's build time and I'm planning to print so printing on Friday night or Saturday morning if we have some more additions uh, so the workshop here starts at 8 a.m. and by 9 a.m. we're going to be in a workshop. Uh, 9 a.m. is the absolute latest. You can possibly print stuff out up until like 9 a.m. on Saturday. So 1 p.m. And whoever cannot make it, please watch the video of the process so you can jump right in and uh, depending on how many people we have I mean we've got way more people on a team if we could all swarm it then we could get just a tremendous amount of the language agnostic instructionals done now what's in the way of that we are continuing just kinda wrapping up the as far as the filament maker the power cube we're working on um, we can get back to the power cube work next week as well when we talk about the absolute cutoff on a, on a power cube um, next week if we finalize some of the power cube design that would be excellent but right now we kinda have a little bit of competition between doing some of the language agnostic instructionals for the 3d printer versus continuing on a power cube which is also important but we do have over 15 people so if we could divide up those tasks maybe follow up with some people because um, we only got a few people signed in here so um, 
just to talk about what needs to be done on a power cube so we've got a lot of the the pieces coming together and then it's about assembling them together um, into a working geometry main things for the workshop itself is that we have the correct cutting files like for example like on the frame that's the part that we're gonna have to get CNC cut now that frame is like almost ready I mean well it's not ready until we check that everything fits in there so uh, the next priority in a power cube was is literally a fit test if you can call it I guess a fit test do all the components that we have fit within the 24 inch so this is 24 inch on each side um, does the engine fit in there you know and that's why we want just the placeholders we say okay we've got the engine it's so big based on its very very basic dimensions like it says the on the specs it says the dimensions are XYZ well if you draw up a cube that's XYZ does it actually fit in that space if you consider that you've got all these other elements in there so and we also mentioned about the cooler that we can put it outside uh, we would make a separate cooler so the cooler doesn't have to go inside the frame it, it would go on the outside uh, but all the other parts cooler fan is goes on the outside but everything else the, the engine and pump essentially we gotta fit it inside so the, the main question is engine and pump and filter return line filter forward hoses do they fit uh, we should really think about somebody who can do that and commit to doing that maybe by next time uh, does anyone want to jump at that the, anyone who's um, eager about the power cube because that's something like the, as far as the frame fit we got to get that stuff out like next week probably by next Tuesday we got to get it out for CNC now we can also do this by hand it's not too complicated to do it it will take more time uh, but it's definitely not prohibitive to do this by by hand if we don't get the cat in time so you know there's two and a half weeks until the workshop itself we can just manually if we're just building one power cube and we've got all day and a bunch of people um, you know we can divvy up like you can actually have say four people you know six people seven people torching you know just by hand just using a straight edge uh, so that's doable in a worst case scenario we can do it by hand it, and then it's still doable it will be uh, you can weld it together it will just take longer but if we have a lot of people for the power cube workshop uh, where, which which at that workshop we're gonna have a, you know probably a dozen people or so um, it's doable both ways but hopefully we can get it in time so we can we can do the the CAD then DXFs to torch table cutting outsourcing that or possibly even if we get our torch table going here we're working on it very actively for the next two weeks uh, there's a small chance that we, we're actually going to cut this with our own torch table because uh, we're moving right along on that. All right, so that's that's that. Uh, let's see, on the torch torch height controller, the latest on that is we're building it here. We're wiring up the the stepper drivers. I think Oliver has updated his log on that, uh, the wiring diagram. Oliver, you want to pipe in for a sec? Or? Yeah, hello, good evening. Yeah, good evening, hello. Um, yeah, I've... I've worked on the documentation so far, and uh, here, here I sent the link. Um, I've uh, prepared a more detailed uh, description of how the pinouts is in detail and uh, which pins have to get connected together. I found it a bit difficult to put it in the graphics, but I, I have put it, I've described it in the text. There were some things to uh, check and so on. Can you give us another and, um, sorry can you give us a better the link thing I've done is, uh, I've sorry sorry yes sorry Oliver can you send another link that one's what? not working so well the link does not work uh, maybe link to the diagram direct let's see oh okay yeah it's just edit so you've got the details Okay, so you're you're doing graphical documentation there. You you got the pictures. That's what you're doing. Yes, and uh, okay, and have uh, in the text description 
uh, explain de in detail which pins uh, to connect because I found it a little bit difficult to put the the thing in the graphic itself because the fonts are too small and I have had to do some explanations here and there so I did it in the text so this should basically uh, enable you to rebuild the thing yeah and uh, do the correct wirings okay and the second thing I've done uh, the second thing I've done is I've uh, uploaded a new firmware version where it is integrated that you press the knob and um, then it reacts on that and uh, like I said last time uh, if you press the knob then you are in a manual mode where you can adjust the height and uh, if you then again press the knob you are in the automatic balancing mode where it balances about the oh, okay. height and the next thing I am currently working on is to integrate the end stop thing but uh, this is just a convenient thing you can use it already as it is by uh, adjusting the zero position by hand before starting and then it goes from there and has this as, as, as zero but I, I, I add the um, end stop thing immediately I'm, I'm working on that okay and as far as the the actual description, like you got to press the knob to get into manual mode, where is that documented? Do you have any comments on that? More comments uh, on the code there? No, or? Not, not, so, not so far. I, I, okay. will, I will add that uh, in, the, in the firmware section where, where the link is to the GitHub. I do this immediately after the meeting. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so this is good. So basically just to summarize what's happening here is we've got the ramps here, the standard, that this red part is the normal controller we use on a 3D printer, but then we're just going from there. Instead of using the tiny stepper drivers, we use this big stepper driver to handle up to four motors at a time. There, and the reason there being, uh, of course, we need more power for the torch table, so the little ramps cannot sustain that. And what we're going to do is connect four, y four motors in parallel to one of these TB6 6600s here, these big stepper drivers. So we're going to be driving uh, like the X axis with four motors and the Y axis with four motors. And it's just a way to show that you can use the identical, identical parts for the much larger torch table. And we probably might end up yeah. using, I mean in the future we'll, we'll end up using bigger parts like bigger stepper driver, bigger stepper motors, uh, bigger belts, bigger sprockets. But for now we're just testing the limits of the small axis thing. Because we are, like as soon as we master the torch table in a month or two, um, we're gonna have to move right on to the two inch universal axis for super heavy duty machining. So we're gonna be building our own lathes and mills and all of that like soon so that's that's very important and once again based on a universal axis system and at that point we're going to definitely need a bigger stepper stepper motors but i mean you can also play with that and say that you have a very tiny stepper motor that just moves your heavy duty machine but very very slowly but with a lot of gear down that's also another route to go so we're going to play with all these scalability issues as time goes on okay yeah, well, that's I think that should be in generally possible to drive several motors because it's only the signal what they yeah. get and the signal is always the same so it should be possible if you want to do bigger stepper drivers like i mentioned in the beginning i have um, the, the version of the power lulu stepper driver which can be up to 10 amps and uh, um, we can give this also wait yeah. uh is the power lulu is that open source it's not really open source is it or is it um, yeah, there are several designs out there. I think I've mentioned that in my, in my, in my log in the beginning. There are several designs out and I think one is free, but uh, it's not a big problem to see what is there on the schematics and simply re-engineer that. But yeah. the, the original Power Lulu thing can be that it's not completely free, but uh, yeah, however, what it do you mean? can be possible. <laughs> what do you mean it's not completely free? Yeah, um, um, like I said, there there is another guy. The, the, the original maker of that is a German guy, and um, there was an Italian guy who 
Nate also plans to put it in the internet, and I think they are free under under open source license as as we want it. Okay. Um, right. I think I thought the license was NC, but I may be wrong. But whatever happens here, we can get into this later. Like right now, we've got the easy off-the-shelf TB6-6600, but I think what we want to do is um, open source the power Lolus or do like a fully open source, Like especially when we have the CNC circuit mill, we can mill our own uh, drivers that are for as large amperage as possible. Um, and right now, the TB6600, they're not, they're not bad. They're only like $8 for one, so it's relatively cheap. Um, so really no financial constraints there, but we do want to have an open source version, which we'll get to sometime in our ample spare time, of course. So, okay, uh, that's good. Yeah, so we'll, and, and yeah. the thing, uh, the other way that you said to, to do two, two motors or something on one axis should also work like it is doing in the zx in the z-axis of each uh, normal 3d printer also yeah um then i want to mention uh, mention for the upcoming thing if you want to integrate uh, the height controller into the rams board with the manual version that should work more or less out of the box i yeah. think yeah 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 and um, um yeah for the sensing versions um should take maybe into account that it needs a certain time for sampling so there may be timing issues noise issues i don't know one one has to try it but maybe this could not be not so easy but i mean on the other hand uh, the, the, the the modular uh, var variante variant is is always given there yeah i mean you can always drive the, the uh, heights uh, by by an external height controller and so on, but the manual version should be possible to integrate. Into yeah, programs. yeah. I mean that's on our schedule for if you look at. Like all of, all of the box. Yeah. yeah, so uh, we've got a cunning plan here on that. So in the next two weeks, we want to have the auto height control, not auto, the manual height control with automatic gas shut off. Like so, we just got a solenoid valve. Um, so I'll put a link to the cunning plan right here um, on a D3D CNC torch table page. If you go to the working document there, which is the version three, this is version three of the CNC torch table working doc. Uh, if you go in there, uh, here's our schedule. So we got these gas solenoids for the auto turn on of cutting oxygen, but we're on, this is like, August 8th these are the next two weeks but right now we're so we're setting up three more 3d printers we're setting up the XY system so tomorrow we're gonna probably finish building all the axes and then start mounting that on our big torch table that we have here like you see in a picture we've got this structure here that we can put the axes on then on the 10th we're gonna wire up the TB6600 test the XY motion with Cura. We were just going to do simple motion with Cura, the 3D printer control software. And then on the 11th, that's Friday, build the Z controller, test the up and down correction with just simple XY motion. And then on Saturday, we were going to do the build the auto gas turn on. So once again, a simple Arduino going to a little relay, going to the gas turn on with a gas solenoid like you see here you can click on those and then Sunday by Sunday do the test runs so we've got the electronics and, and mechanical so by this this Sunday we should should have it and then next week we should actually start doing sample cutting so we'll see if we we can stick to the schedule Emmanuel is here until that Saturday so um, he can definitely do a lot of this we decided to go we had the 3d printed bushings uh, we decided that we're going to go with the metal ones. These have more, definitely have more friction uh, than the metal ones. But the metal ones are just simple $2 parts, so we can afford it. Uh, but we decided to go straight to there just to minimize some of the risks. Um, so maybe we'll return to these 3D printed ones later once we have 
a better idea but for now let's we're doing like the first first iteration don't put risk into that so still use the 3d printed carriage but use the smaller metal bushings so that's that's what we're doing right now as we speak yep so that's where we're at okay so excellent we're gonna follow the instructions on the wiring up the large stepper drivers um, which should go into yeah if you have questions ask and I'll help you yep so that's the for the Toshiba 6600 it looks like in the diagrams that you have they are pretty much you know complete like which where does this pin you know from left to right five volts ground DT clock um, yeah that is because in this case jumper seven or something the pins are not uh, uh, numbered rotary the numbers encoder, are yeah. in, this, in the scheme but um, they, they have no real numbers that's why I described them from left to right and in this orientation that you can read the step and then uh, yeah yeah Yep, so that's the that's the connection to the the little knob. Uh, we've got the connection. Looks like you described these uh, in words. So as long as that description is clear in words, we can follow that. And here, you also mention in words which everything yes. where everything connects to. And, so we should be good to go. And most of. Yep. And most of the stuff is edited. I mean, the, the rotary encoder is already mounted to jumper seven. You simply have yeah. to uh, elongate the switch line, which is um, must be. Um, I, I've put one Dupont wire cable with fe female female within the package. You simply have to put yeah. it on that, and then. Um, put it uh, on top of the Arduino there is a ICSP the programming port and there you have to put it on one pin that's the workaround because uh, in the beginning I had another rotary encoder in mind when I made the design of the PCB uh, which which didn't have that function and therefore it was only four pole pins and then it was too late because the, the board was already in fabrication to change that but it's no problem to do that put that on the on the uh, ICSP port pin on the Arduino and um, as a workaround and I have already in the latest firmware um, integrated that it expected the signal on that pin right yeah. um, so I'm not that, 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 that. so okay so the stuff about the Arduino what you just said is that documented here because I we might have to document that is yes, that, that that, that's my text description stuff where okay. I explain things like that. Okay, that sounds good. Now, this is for the height controller. When we use not the height controller, but just directly to the stepper motors, that should also be clear from this description, correct? Because what we um, need is, is uh, specifically sorry. how you go from ramps, which is actually you don't have an explicit... Well, here... What we need is a detailed description of That's, of this thing. Yeah, the the correction, the connection to RAMs you can find in the manual version. Um, here is here. described how to connect the TB six thousand six hundred to the to our board, and in the manual version that was there's a description how you connect the driver to the. To the RAM sport. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm seeing these pictures here, but I'm not seeing a description of where all the wires go to, though. You you can connect connect it to the places where normally the the, the little Polulo drivers are sitting on, and um, they are also uh, denoted like enable, step, and dir, and that is the same label what I have uh, used on the PCB. Right, but I'm not sure they're labeled well well on the pol on the ramps board, are they? Um, let's see. I mean, w okay. So here, what what I have like say I haven't done this before. Um, it's not exactly transparent, so I would ask. Uh, can you just do a pin 
just a simpler pin diagram because here yeah we we can like kind of start tracing it but we we looked at it and we we're like okay wh where exactly does each wire go to i mean you can see in general but would you mind doing a, a diagram where you state explicitly you take all these pinouts here and the pololu and the power plug here and show how that all connects because here like for example we don't need the jog wheel here in our case of controlling the the xy using uh using cura all we need is power here we need power to the tb the toshiba driver and then the just i think only two pins and then you have like four do we need four we need all four of them i guess so um, do we the number the number four is the ground pin okay yeah right and but yeah way, here i sent you a link uh, where where the the ram spot is uh, uh, descriptive in, in detail and uh, where you find uh, which parts that are but uh, the, 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 the basic um, uh, connection between the TB and any RAMs or our board or whatever is that you have three signal lines, enable, dear, and step, and you have one for ground. And um, on the TB6600 module, there is for each dear, step, and pulse, like they call it there, is an additional uh, ground line or minus line. And uh, it's it's not necessarily to connect them all. It's just okay to just use one. But there you have to make a bridge uh, to the towards the other ground uh, lines. And uh, this is also explained in, in my um, yeah, documentation. Right. We still need a diagram for the dummy. I could I could see now those four pins. But I mean, you're you're asking for some translation. We need a thing that you it says connect, you know, this pin to that pin on the on a stepper driver, etc. I mean, you have to piece that from several documents right now. So um, you think you could do that, or you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I know what you're saying yeah, here. Sure. We've got um, you are enough info. Yep. You are talking about what? Yeah, yeah. description how it gets connected to the RAM spot. Is this yeah. right? That's correct, yeah. Just a simple diagram if I mean which um I mean if you do okay here, you know, drawing it out right here. You know, you've got these things. So you got those connectors on the T B, let's say. How many there are like eight or how many on a TB that we need to use? Um, there are four uh, connection lines to the controller board, be it RAMs or our PCB. Then you have four ports in which uh, the stepper motor is getting connected. And then you have two lines for the power supply. And I would suggest to uh, power it directly from the power supply. Right. Oh, that's like I did in my setup. Okay, so what I need is, you see this here? This is TB here, this is Pololo. Uh, what are those connections there? Which wire connects to where? You see it? And there's the power supply. PS, the power supply has like two things. This is what, what we need. Power supply's got two plus minus. Pololo's got those four pins. And then the TB has, I think, eight pins or whatever. Uh, which wire goes to where? That's the magical diagram I'm looking for. Yeah, it, it is important to differentiate between the power connection on the new PCB and on the RAM spot because there is the, the, the big green connector which uh -huh. is called Phoenix Contact and on the RAM spot it has traditionally two times 12 volts plus ground uh, and, and uh, uh, ground and on, on my board there is um, 5 volt and 12 volt, but um, if you would uh, immediately plug in a configuration for a RAM board into my board, then you would blow the board because you have 5 volt, uh, 12 volt on, yeah. the, on the 5 five volt line. Therefore, I configured it in the way that I only have the 5 volt connection going to this uh, input port of power supply and it is 
denoted okay. or identifiable by the red color of, of the normal piece of power supply. And um, the, the 12 volt line, I don't go through the board. I in the beginning thought I would go through the board, but at the moment I would not uh, recommend that because um, I had a, the, the, the screw terminal is a little bit small. I mean, it would go, but it could be problematically with bigger motors, which draws more amps. And um, so I would recommend to connect then uh, the power supply directly with the TB6500. Uh, uh, right. Okay, so you see this? You see my screen? Yes. Okay, can you draw the lines as far as how, what I need to connect to what? Uh, yeah, could you do that okay. as the next thing then? That would be great. So that's a simple diagram for you've got a power supply, you've got the Pololu ramps board, you got those little mm -hmm. four pins there, and you've got the Toshiba driver. you got so many pins there. Yeah, so we need that because that's a mystery to yeah. me right now. That, that is basically what, what uh, is in the... In the a ramps diagram where I've just posted the link, but you there I have denoted it with some blue points or something, yeah. and you want me to have this, yeah, do yeah, you yeah. want me to have this as a direct line yeah. wiring that the yeah. wiring scheme uh, of the survey is better surveyable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can just take a look at it, and uh, and and a gorilla or a chimpanzee could take a look at this diagram and connect it. I, I think that's a good model draw it so that a chimpanzee could actually connect this does that make yeah. sense and and i had connected it in that case i think to the x port and i would then connect it to the z port because that's the height thing on the ramps and uh, then we must probably exchange some pins in the firmware right and then there's some of the settings. There's like some of the micro stepping settings. So maybe uh, we'll worry oh, about yeah. that later. But and then maybe like maybe you can also like show the micro stepping settings because there's some adjustments on the TB there. Okay, but yeah, can you do this? Like, uh, can you prioritize just this one? Because we're like ready to wire this up, or we're gonna blow blow up our controller. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So that's good work. We're ready. We're ready to implement that. That's really good. Um, all right. Excellent. So let's wrap up the meeting here since we've got another meeting to go to. Um, so as far as people for tomorrow's tomorrow's meeting, um, yeah, let's see how many people show up. But after tomorrow's meeting, we'll be able to see if uh, we really need to round up somebody to uh, like maybe talk to Ahmed about uh, continuing a power cube someone's got to fit that power cube into that. that that's like one out of the many people should do that and we'll try to get that going so otherwise tomorrow we'll have the design sprint on the um, getting the language agnostic instructionals which is which is a very big advancement towards our documentation especially if we can find that multiple people can learn how to do it and, and make pretty attractive designs uh, so it kind of gets into the combination of um, art with documentation but because we're cutting the things out of FreeCAD, the, the art is going to be very nice. So as long as we follow some conventions on how we represent the isometric views and then put them into the, the language agnostic instructions, it should be a good exercise to see what's possible with a group of people who are not necessarily artists. So that's good. Uh, we'll test it. So we'll see you tomorrow uh, on that. And I'm recording this, so I'm going to quit the recording here. And uh, see you guys tomorrow. And... Uh, if you're not doing anything for this week, just just email me. See if we can allocate you to some tasks. I'm gonna try to go through people's logs to see what what's best uh, what's best for each person. But clearly, if you're not doing anything, uh, you don't have a specific task assigned. Please email me so we can get you a task because there's a lot of different things. Um, but I'm not sure if who is actually completing a task or if we can actually assign some more tasks to other people. So please let me know. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. And we'll see you otherwise next Tuesday on the 1 p.m. time. Let's talk about the meeting time. I, I think what we want to do is probably separate the meetings to maybe like uh, the main meeting just like regular, like we have 1 p.m. right now, and maybe like a Wednesday for like the tractor meeting or something. I, I would prefer that. So if we have the 12... 
the, the 1 p.m. Tuesday regular meeting. Uh, then we do the separate tractor meeting the day after. I think that's going to be a little easier so we don't pack up all these meetings into one day. Um, I think that's better. So Tuesday for the regular meeting, as always, 1 p.m. forever from now on until we get 4,000 OSC developers. We're going to continue at 1 p.m. on Tuesday. And then uh, Wednesday we'll do the special meetings like the tractor, which is right now. So uh, I'll, I'll email people out about that. But that, that would be a good plan, I think, for uh, moving forward since it's a little heavy to do a couple meetings a day. Okay, thanks everybody, and we'll see you soon.